um, and really excited to welcome everyone for the keynote speak uh, keynote today. So I'm going to. I have the privilege. My name is Allison. I'm the junior fellow here, and I have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker. So Dr. Glenn A. Jones is a professor of higher education and former dean of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. He holds an Ontario chair, a research chair in post-secondary education policy and measurement, and he's the director of the Center for the Study of Canadian and International Higher Education. He's the author of more than 150 papers in the field of higher education. His research and teaching interests focus on higher education policy, governance, and academic work. He's an author of numerous books. I'm not gonna list all of them, but his most recent being Internationalization and the Academic Profession, Comparative Perspectives. Dr. Jones is a past president of the Canadian Society for the Study of Higher Education and a former editor of the Canadian Journal of Higher Education. He has received the Distinguished Research Award from the Canadian Society for the Study of Higher Education and the Distinguished Member Award. He's also won awards for his research from the Canadian Bureau on International Education and the Council on International Higher Education in the United States. He has held visiting professor appointments at the University of Hong Kong, the University of the West Indies, Beijing Normal University, Fudan University, and he was an Erasmus Mundus visiting scholar at the University of Oslo in 2008. His research projects have been funded by so many different folks, and they include a range of agencies and organizations, including the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities, the Canada Millennium Scholarship Foundation, and the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario. His contract research activities have included work for a, for a number of governments, as well as the Law Society of Upper Canada, UNESCO, and the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada, to name a few. He's been a member of external review teams for a number of universities in Canada and abroad, and he's currently a member of the Alberta government's Minister's Advisory Committee on Higher Education and Skills. For us in higher education, he's all that we would hope to be, and as one of my colleagues says, he's amazing. So having said that, he's gonna be delivering the Walter Gordon Symposium's keynote this year on university faculty and public policy, we're so excited and privileged to have you here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And Allison, you can give me an introduction anytime. Thank you very, very much. Um, you've heard some wonderful panels that essentially provide um, sort of in, in, in individual expertise and experience on this, and I'm going to draw a little bit on that, but I'm going to move things up a little bit and sort of look at around 10,000 feet. How do we understand some of these interactions? And I do so both as a practitioner of someone who's, who's attempted to be involved with public policy, but also as a scholar. I have a very strong interest in trying to understand academic work, and some of those interests have included trying to understand the work that they're doing in the sphere that you're talking about, and that is the sphere of public policy. Um, some of what I'm going to be talking about has actually just been published uh, a year or so ago. Uh, so there is a paper if anybody's interested in it. It's really a kind of exploratory review of the literature in a particular area, um, but it's really about exactly the same topic. How do we understand the role of the professoriate in public policy? Um, one more. Okay. There's, there's two kind of concepts or ideas I just want to introduce you to. Some of you who are in political science will know these ideas very, very well. But, but one is to, just to recognize that policy emerges from very specialized sectors within government. We often think of the premier or the prime minister, but most policy activity is much farther down. In fact, many, many levels down. Uh, often it's not within a ministry, it's within a subunit within a ministry, which has been charged for a particular responsibility for trying to understand policy and policy within a particular range of activities. So, and, and around that lead agency, many political scientists talk in terms of policy communities or policy networks, but there is a collection of individuals and organizations which are also engaged in these policy conversations. So around the lead agency, there may be uh, pressure groups, uh, there may be uh, uh, individuals who represent vested interests in terms of businesses, there may be not-for-profit organizations which have an interest in that particular sector. There's a range of groups which play roles in terms of informing government about policy, but also play a role in terms of closely monitoring and attempting to influence or at least 
uh, inform government about possible directions in a particular area. So highly decentralized. And think about very different policy areas like, like uh, housing, uh, healthcare, which has a wide range of subunits within healthcare, uh, transportation. And then on the other side of the equation, we're talking about universities. And I think both governments and universities may be the most complicated organizations that the human species have created, especially a large research university like this one. So both governments and universities are engaged in a tremendous range of activities, and universities are also very loosely coupled organizations. They are organizations that, that um, uh, special, have tremendous specialization in terms of knowledge, but most of that knowledge, of course, is on the ground floor of the institution and the work of faculty and their labs and those kinds of activities. So when we talk about this, it's important to think of this as an interface between specialized policy processes on the one hand and faculty expertise on the other. So there's professors and policy, this, this kind of involvement takes place in the interfa inter interface between a specialized unit within government which has a, been delegated or designated with some policy responsibilities and faculty who are, with, who are engaged in research that's related to that policy area. Sometimes directly, a lot of this activity isn't, doesn't have the word policy in it, right? It is other kinds of expertise that are being used. So you can imagine, for example, interactions involving a Department of Agriculture and people who have specialized knowledge in agricultural economics or who may be very interested in uh, agricultural practices and want to inform policy in those particular areas. Uh, we've already heard mentioned a tremendous number of countries created specialized councils and advisory panels dealing with COVID. Wonderful example. Um, where, where the idea of having expertise attached to government was viewed as fundamental. And of course, we've already heard some of those uh, councils were disbanded as they were in South Africa and a few other places. Uh, some of them uh, were roughly tolerated by government and some of them actually played an important, real important role in terms of uh, advising government on particular policy directions within that area. Let me just make sure I'm on right. So one of the ways in which this happens is, and we've already talked about it a lot in this last session, the, the, the role that they play as advisors and consultants to government. So policy sectors often engage faculty as advisors and consultants. Sometimes that's by direct relationship. Sometimes it's through advisory boards. Uh, sometimes these are short arrangements uh, where essentially there's a reach out for particular expertise. Um, some of these advisings may be several hours. In other words, it may simply be somebody reaching out to a faculty member saying, listen, I'm working in this policy area. I don't understand it. Can you spend two hours providing me with some background based on your research in terms of how I might understand and think about this and perhaps direct me to some other people who can do the same thing. So some of it is, is, is big, some of it is quite small, but there's an awful lot of this activity. Um, there's a whole research literature on expert panels. There's a big series of expert panels in the EU, a whole notion of rural task forces in Canada. So there's a lot of literature that draws on some of these activities. A lot of these roles are frequently fluid and issue specific. In other words, faculty often move in and out of these areas depending on their level of engagement and depending on the policy issues being addressed. So it's not as if we're talking about a lot of people who are spending a large part of their academic lives in this involvement. That's, I think, a relatively modest number of individuals. Often people are tapped on the shoulder because they have expertise that is required at a particular time period and there's a fluidity. They move in and out. They may not want to continue to be engaged because of that experience. Others uh, want to sustain those levels of activity. Um, there's a, there's a lot of literature that talks about how civil servants value these professional experiences. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but the, the notion of governments not having a lot of internal expertise in some elements of these policy environments, and therefore valuing the opportunity to talk to individuals or learn from individuals who have particular kinds of expertise that are not in government, or where those views may be different than the views held by civil servants within government. And so that opportunity to learn something different through these activities. Um, and then there's another body of literature which talks about some of the reasons why faculty play a large role in this from the perspective of government. There's a perceived legitimacy of the title of professor. Um, and unlike many consultants, faculty come with a track record. You can actually look at their CVs online. You can look at the 15 publications that are done in this area. There's a perceived legitimacy associated with their expertise that may not be true in other, other consulting sectors within the system. Um, they have bring research experience in the field. And they can demonstrate that they've been engaged in a whole series of studies in this particular area. But more importantly, perhaps than anything else, there's a perception that they're nonpartisan. 
In other words, many elements of government are dealing so often with vested interests of one sort or another. So the notion and perception of faculty is somehow neutral. That may not always be the case, but that perception of neutrality plays a particular role in these engagements. So the expertise, the legitimacy of their role, and this perception of nonpartisan political engagement that becomes important for understanding this role that they play. Um, just to give you a sense, this is from some interviews on this related topic. Uh, one person says, there's no doubt that they use my work. It filters into their reports and documents. It's like they're saying, we know that this is a controversial point, so we hired an objective person to look at it. We are doing what an expert says is the right thing to do. You see the positioning of legitimacy playing a role in that conversation. Another person, which gives you a sense of a whole other kind of activity you may not have even thought of. Some of my consulting work is really a matter of evaluating the research work of the government people. Um, all they really want at the end is a letter that states that they've used the right tests and that the date supports their conclusion, a kind of audit function that's not uncommon in some of the science areas. Of course, the letter has to be written on University of Toronto letterhead because it will be used to support their decision. So, so both a kind of audit using of expertise and the legitimacy of the name on the letterhead play a role in that relationship. One more. So the other role that they play, if we think about that policy community with all kinds of other organizations often embedded in it, faculty are often engaged in, in, uh, in work working for some of those organizations. Think about the, the organizations in many areas of social policy where key actors may be, again, uh, advocacy organizations, but advocacy organizations that are trying to understand the sector that they're advocating for. And so the notion of faculty working as, as, uh, as, as researchers and consultants within policy networks and working for advocacy organizations and doing many of the same roles that we've talked about. Some of these, I mean, we talked about the pharmaceutical firm, so some of those are those kinds of activities, and that is being engaged in consulting from a pharmaceutical company, but also imagine individuals who are involved in social justice organizations where they're looking for data and expertise that can help them advocate on behalf of a particular group of people. The fact member may not have advocacy organization material, but they may have ways of thinking about the problem, thinking about the issue. They may have expertise and data that the government or the organization do not have. And so there are reasons for them to get engaged with this to essentially provide expertise. So this notion of contributing to sort of evidence-based policy discussions, not only by direct engagement with government, but also with other organizations who are also participating within this com policy community kind of arrangement. And then the third sort of way of direct engagement um, is, is really about as members of the attentive public. And this is a, a very simple idea, but the notion is if you think about a policy community, it does take a lot of energy um, and often resources to participate in that group. You think about the resources of an advocacy organization. And faculty are sort of unique because they have considerable flexibility in how they spend their time, how they use and disseminate their research. And there is a sort of symbiotic relationship that often emerges for those who do policy work and then the government agencies that they are engaged with, that there's, they're monitoring and understanding. So the notion of faculty who may submit briefs to government whenever public calls, they may participate in panels, not as a member of the panel, but as an, an individual who wants to come in and share their expertise in those kinds of forums. Um, and, and this notion of, of uh, individual faculty who are already engaged in this research area wanting to share that expertise to these kinds of forums in addition to the sort of direct engagement that might occur in relation to, to uh, advising or consulting or less formal even activities. So what do we learn from, from some of these, uh, this broad area of research? Keep in mind, there's a relatively little research on this in the, from the perspective of university faculty. Most of the research is the perspective of government, it's the perspective of public administration, or it shows up in sectoral work, right? People who do work on, on agricultural policy or transportation policy, who when they under, try to understand what's happening, observe faculty playing roles on panels and on other advisory groups. So that's, it's this broad range of activities that leads to this broad range of literature. Um, so th they, they certainly play a direct role in contributing their expertise. There's a lot of indirect action. We've talked about knowledge mobilization, writing op-eds, but my focus here really is on the sort of direct engagement. So they, they play a direct role in contributing to expertise in the public policy process. 
The, the relationships are flu frequently fluid and episodic. It's not as if people spend their careers with, perhaps that's true in some areas of public policy, but, but it, for many of these individuals, it's not as if they're spending their careers engaged in this. They move in and they move out, depending on the policy issues being discussed and the particular interests that they have as part of this. Um, there's obviously a selection bias. In other words, the, the government has often selected the, the, the advisor or the consultant. They've done that for a variety of reasons that we may never exactly know. They may have chosen somebody, but they, they've read their research and they know how they've landed already. So there may be a, a, a kind of selection bias in that respect. And the same is true on the other side. In other words, there's a lot of faculty who for very good reasons decide not to engage in these kinds of activities. But there are those who are interested or those who are interested in stepping in for a short period of time, this sort of episodic uh, participation. Um, and, 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 but it's important to recognize that there's a bias on both sides, right? There's people who want to do this and feel that they can make a contribution who say yes, and those who choose them or, or, or through some process decide that this person would be a good consultant and that person says yes. So both are selection processes. It does require trust on both sides. Um, there's some literature on the, what happens when these trust relationships break down, but obviously the government has to place some trust on who they've appointed or who they've asked as an advisor. That, that some of that is about the legitimacy of the, their academic knowledge. Some of it is because of the perceived neutrality, but there has to be a trust in sort of valuing uh, expertise. And as we know, in some of the more current literature about populist governments, there are ways in which that expertise has declined in some spheres of activity, at least certainly at the macro level, though I think even in some of the governments which have talked a lot about disliking expertise, you'll still see an awful lot of activity on the ground floor because you still have people in government who say, I really do need advice, I really need to understand this particular policy area, and regardless of what happens in the broader rhetoric, I would still like to be engaged in these conversations. Um, and the same is true, of course, for the fact member. They have to be able to trust, not necessarily that someone's going to do what they say they're going to do, that's not what this is about, but they have to trust that there's a kind of fairness in the relationship and that their expertise will have some meaning uh, within these arrangements. Um, there are lots of challenges of academic communication and knowledge mobilization associated with this. Um, I was talking to a speaker in the last panel just a few minutes ago, um, and I was saying that there's an interesting study that was done in the UK where essentially they surveyed very senior level civil servants about their use of academic consultants. And there were two things that I thought were very interesting that came from that. W one w was that a number of people commented on the fact that they really enjoyed and learned from the way in which fact members synthesize material. In other words, the way in which faculty members organize and discuss a problem in ways that may be very different than the ways that have been discussed inside the unit that they came from, and their ability to pull together a variety of ideas in ways that for them were very different and distinctive. So that notion of sort of synthesis and within that communication. But the second issue that shows up, and you'll see it in different, some different bodies of literature within this, is the notion of the fact that faculty speak in a language that is often very different than the language inside the unit. And so the notion of how do we translate what may be wonderful ideas that the fact member is giving us into a language that we can actually use internally within our unit to, to, to have some sort of change take place or actually use this in a vital way. So that very different languages of public policy, of, of the sort of common languages that might be used within the ministry and the kind of academic vocabulary which may be undiscernible for some individuals who are receiving this input or receiving this advice. And another element is the sort of risks of politicization and co-option. And that is, um, on the politicization, it's on two levels, right? It's the danger of being perceived as, as, a, as a, a political figure within the academic community, being co-opted because of your participation within the public sphere. Um, but there's also a, a kind of danger of the politicization of someone's work. In other words, you may do a piece of scholarship and a piece of consulting that is used in ways you no longer control. And, and there's a real danger in, that shows up in some of this literature about the fact that you do lose control of this activity. And that sometimes your work is used to justify policies that may have no bearing on what you actually said. But you were used as a consultant and you were positioned in a particular kind of way. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the opposite side to the trust when the trust breaks down and the work that you do is used and your name is used in a particular way that may have damage not only in the public policy process but in terms of your own reputation as a scholar within the work that you're doing. 
Um, a few concluding observations, and I'll leave enough time for a couple of questions. Um, I, I think the overall conclusion is higher education contributes to public policy through the direct involvement of a lot of faculty. Um, there have been very few major studies, but the ones that have been done suggest that somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of all faculty are engaged in these kinds of activities. Now, some of it's, as I said, very short, maybe a matter of several telephone calls. It may be a matter of a, a, an appointment to a board or another activity, but a large number of faculty are engaged. And it's not just in the social sciences, it's across the spectrum. Social sciences tend to be higher, uh, the arts and fine arts tend to be lower, but it is across the university because it involves this wide range of specializations interacting with government, which is also engaged in highly specialized policy communities. Um, I think there's lots of evidence that suggests that, that, that faculty play uh, a very distinctive role. They're usually outside the political process. They're often perceived as being outside the political process. They have positions of authority given the titles that they have, and they have a track record that establishes their legitimacy. They're not chosen out of the blue. They are chosen because they have uh, experience, they've published, they've done work in this particular area, and that's used to some extent as a legitimacy element within the political process. Um, but the nature of this work allows for fluid engagement, that, that faculty don't, that this is not their full-time job. Their full-time job is research and teaching, and they can make decisions about how to do this or how not to do this, and it allows for them to move in and out depending on their own interests, how they're pursuing their scholarship, the degree to which they see relationship between their scholarship and the kinds of issues or questions that have been raised by government. Um, it, most of this activity is also invisible. Um, University of Toronto has no way of tracking uh, individual faculty engaged in these activities in their relationships with government. They might know something about formal contracts, but in terms of a lot of this activity, which is quite fluid and minor, um, there's no way of recording this. And the same is true within government. In other words, there may be formal understandings of consultants and the contract approval processes, but so much of this activity, again, is, is informal, uh, is episodic, the government itself, if you, no one in the central government would have any clue as to who's playing a role in terms of advising and consulting at very lower levels of the institution. So a lot of it's simply invisible. It shows up, as I said, in people who study particular kinds of policy work, policy communities, policy initiatives, and it shows up a little bit inside the higher education literature in terms of faculty engagement. But it's not something that's ever tracked. So most of this activity, which I think is quite common, is, is quite invisible. And one way of thinking about this, and, and it shows up in some of the literature from the government perspective, is, is the, the recognition that universities are kind of reservoir of expertise. In other words, if you don't have expertise inside government, or if there's issues of trust inside government, you have this other reservoir, and you can make decisions about how you use it or not. Uh, of course, the other side has to agree to this, but it is a kind of reservoir of expertise that often has very strong policy expertise inside those elements. So it's that notion of, of the, this space that universities occupy, given this home of expertise that allows them to participate or not in this policy environment and contributes often to policy expertise required by government that doesn't have or that is looking to validate a kind of direction that is thinking about going in. So I'll, I'll end with that, with the notion of taking some time for some questions and some conversation. How would we enhance the notion, the public and civil service notion, or notion within the public and within the civil service and within politicians, that uh, academia is this reservoir? I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, and I, I think that, um, I think that there are individuals within the civil service who recognize that. Um, I, I, I think it's the, some of this activity has long histories. In other words, there are, there are sectors of government policy where there's a long history of involving expertise. I think there are other sectors where that's relatively less common. So I think the, the complexity of this is that I think the sectors are so different. And the, the communities that, in, that, that they're engaged with are obviously sector specific and very different. Um, and and on, the, on the university side, I mean, I think universities um, don't discourage faculty from, from engaging in public policy. As the last panel indicated, the question of whether there are appropriate incentives 
I, my own sense is that the incentives should be where they are now, roughly. In other words, it's really about research and teaching as the primary activities of the university faculty member. I think they should have a lot of freedom in terms of how they understand that research. They have to, they should, they have to disseminate that research, whether we think peer review is always the best possible way. I happen to think it does. Um, but I think, but I think there are the drivers for faculty participation are a little different. Some of it is about incentives or consulting contracts or those kinds of things. But I think there's something innate within faculty that wants to see their expertise used. They do want to contribute to something. Um, some faculty prefer not to contribute directly to public policy. They want to put things out in the world. They want to do an op-ed. They want to share their information through blogs and other forms of knowledge dissemination. Um, but I think there is, for many faculty, the notion of, I've done this. I think it's important. I think I have a contribution to make. I, I, I think I would like faculty, I would, I would like public policy members to at least understand this or have the opportunity to engage with them in this area so that I could help them and it, therefore have a much more informed public conversation about this particular area. So I think there are built-in incentives from the faculty perspective of I, I want to have impact. Um, it's not always the impact of changing government policy, but it is maybe the impact of sort of saying, listen, I have knowledge here that I think I need to share given this recent, you know, this recent study that I've done. And it could be anything from the fact that you're an environmental scientist who discovered that there are real issues with a particular chemical in terms of its implications for lake. Um, and, and, you know, I've met people like this who essentially say, listen, I've got, I've got something that I think is really important for those who are involved with environmental policy to understand. And I'm going to do my part to, to at least share it. Uh, uh, they make decisions about how they're going to respond to this because they're the government. But I think I've, I've done this. I think I've done something important. I think there's something I can contribute. And it's, I think there's a natural desire to move beyond simply publishing a paper towards some broader form of knowledge dissemination. Uh, thank you for the overview. Um, uh, I'm uh, Tom Max, the public policy chair here at Massey. Um, one of the uh, current uh, issues, um, much publicized, in terms of consultancies and research by academics, um, is collaboration internationally, and in particular with China. Yeah. Um, and, and I just wonder, with the, uh, the issue about uh, working with uh, Chinese research institutions, uh, and I've spent many years myself earlier t teaching in China, um, do you think that the, the, the state uh, has the right to say who you should consult with uh, first? And then secondly, do in, in your view, do individual academics and departments, uh, should they be thinking about the geostrategic element of their collaboration when they're working on vaccine research or higher education re research in uh, Shenzhen and so on. So right. what about this issue of the international and the strategic and government rules about this? I mean, I th I, I, there, there's actually relatively little research about, about this kind of international engagement. There's, there's some work on partnerships and the people who do work on sort of um, research on research itself uh, have certainly um, done some work in this area. I mean, my own sense is that so much of this is about an individual responsibility, right? In other words, I think as scholars, we make decisions about our own research, about, about the partnerships we engage in. I think that, that a lot of policies, including the policies at this university, um, focus on the notion of being thoughtful about those partnerships. Um, and, and some of that's not just about the nature of the other party, but it's also about the, the, um, the, the challenges associated with when things go wrong and partnerships disappear and what happens with resources. A lot of this is about the, the added complexity of these international relationships, especially involving research, that, s that some faculty are very knowledgeable about because they've been involved in this business for some time. But those who are relatively new, there are questions they should probably be asking themselves. And it's not about whether there's evil in the world, but it is about the, the sort of efficacy and the, the, the fiduciary responsibility they have of entering into a relationship and ensuring that that there's wisdom here and that there is, uh, you know, uh, and there's, there's also a whole literature with international relations about the importance of, of you know, we, we are a colonial authority um, and, and understanding that, that power relationship, that the international, there's a, um, a track record of international consulting which is not very good 
of where individuals from one country have come in and solved the problems of another, but they haven't. Um, and in fact, they've probably decreased the, the research capacity of that other country. So there's those kind of challenges to be thought of. The, the first question you raise is, does the government have the right? The, the answer, you know, we're talking about public policy. The answer is yes. The government has the right to make these decisions. Whether they should, whether they've done it in the right way is a whole different question. But government always has the right to establish the laws under which we operate. Um, and there's lots of uh, examples in the world where that's been dastardly wrong um, and lots of examples where they've allowed institutions to essentially do their own thing. Um, I, I, I'm not sure this is the right policy, but it's the policy that the government has come up with. And there is a sense, I think, that um, uh, th there are concerns that have emerged that are relating to national security. I don't have the details. I, I don't have that, that knowledge to know what the nuances of this are. Um, but I think that the answer, does the government have the right? I think the answer is yes. Uh, is this the right policy approach? I think the answer is probably not really. Um, but uh, this is not my policy area of expertise. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation. Um, I, uh, you mentioned one issue which we discussed during the larger break is this so-called mandatory science when uh, some research is done not out of pure curiosity, but at the request of some um, state body, state institutions, that they usually create those councils. So you mentioned selection bias, and that's what we discussed. So are there any ways to avoid or maybe minimize such selection bias? And if there are, maybe you can talk about some like practical examples. Well, I'm not sure that there are mechanisms to do that. I think there are there are different mandates that these councils have, right? There are some. There are certainly examples of, of these kinds of councils which are really designed based on the assumption that the faculty are neutral and that they are contributing uh, expertise based on their positions within the academy. And that's different than other kinds of arrangements where essentially the government's heading in a particular direction and there's a selection of individuals who might provide uh, evidence because of the work they've already done. It's not as if they're doing something new or scandalous, but drawing on the expertise they've already demonstrated um, that where they think that, that that expertise could be useful in moving in a particular direction. I mean, in the end, f faculty can't make government listen to them. Faculty can't make governments appoint them to particular areas. That's not within the system. Governments do have a right to make decisions about how they use expertise. There's a whole literature within political science about how they might use expertise. Um, and, and perhaps there are best practices. Um, but I think in the end, you're always going to end up with a, a sort of selection bias. Uh, and on the faculty side too, right? There are, there are wonderful scholars who, do, who are not interested. They're not interested in engaging with government. They're not interested in the possible risks in terms of their career and positionality. Um, and they may also be not interested because what they really love to do is over here. They love doing this kind of research. And, and if this is a distraction, um, then they would, they can avoid it. Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Jones, for your thoughts and your insights on the university and public policy. Please do join me in a round of applause. Thank you. And our next panel starts at 2.45. Thank you. Thanks. What a wonderful introduction.